of simplified models of dark matter colonization, um, which we call the colonization codex. And so this was done with a large collaboration from Mainz and appeared on the archive towards the end of last year. So in the talk, I'll give you some motivation. I'll tell you about colonization, and I'll talk about simplified models a little bit. I'll then show you the classification, uh, talk about our assumptions, the methodology we used, and then apply it to some LHC phenomenology. And then we really hope this work is something that's useful to the community. And so in the final section, I'll show a bit about how to sort of use the classification that we've produced, um, yeah, and how to sort of match up annotation with, with notation that you're used to. Okay, so first, uh, motivation. So the existence of dark matter is very well established. Um, there's a range of evidence such as that from galactic rotation curves, CMB and isotropies, um, structure formation simulations, and others. And these all point to um, cold, electrically neutral, non-bionic dark matter <coughs> with now a very well measured relic density. So I'm taking one. Can you see this right now, by the way? Maybe it's a little bit low. Uh, so this is the number that's reported in PDG, so it's um, known to be good accuracy now. So this uh, relic density of the dark matter is commonly assumed to result from thermal freeze-out. Uh, this is the sort of, it's often called the wind, the wind miracle, the wind paradigm. And so I'll talk about that a little bit. So in the history of the universe, we have the Big Bang followed by a period of inflation. And then we have this period here where you've got um, the standard model particles before electroweak symmetry breaking all in equilibrium with each other. And you can see here that the PDG has put, in, put a little um, tentative possible dark matter relics here. And so this line is assuming the usual wimp freeze out mechanism. And then in the history of the universe, we go on, uh, there's electroweak symmetry breaking here, then protons and neutrons form, nuclei form, uh, and then finally we have recombination, and the CMB comes from here. This is about 30,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, but for this production of dark matter, we can see we're right back here at 10 to the minus 10 seconds. So the way this freeze out um, mechanism works is that you have some processes that keep them dark matter in equilibrium with the standard model particles. And the key to understanding the freeze out is really a sort of competition between the Hubble expansion of the universe, this H as a function of temperature here, uh, versus the annihilation rate, which is also a function of temperature. So the annihilation rate of this process um, is given by the product of the, the number density uh, times the cross section times the velocity. And so if just the equilibrium number density of these particles, it falls exponentially as, as the temperature reduces, as time goes on. Like that. Um, so this is a, a quickly reducing number. The cross section just on dimensional analysis grounds also reduces as time goes on, and the, the velocity reduces as the time goes on, the temperature the velocity of these particles slow down. So in this radiation dominated area, era at the beginning, the Hubble constant is also reducing with time. Um, but it often happens that the annihilation rate, I mean mostly because of this N is reducing exponentially, that the annihilation rate reduces faster than the Hubble expansion rate. Um, and it's the, the crossover of those two rates which is the key to the freeze out. So here we have the, the classic curve. Um, so this is the co-moving number density. So co-moving means um, like a volume of the universe that expands with the Hubble expansion of the universe. Uh, so we have the co-moving number density uh, plotted as a function of, here it's time, uh, but the actual numbers are the mass of the dark matter over the temperature of the universe. So it's often parameterized in this, in this way as the, the temperature. Temperature reduces, time increases, time goes on. And so this solid black curve here, this is the equilibrium number density of, of particles um, in equilibrium with the standard model particles. And we can see this has the exponential reduction that I mentioned on the previous slide. And so what happens, say at this point here, this is the, the freeze out temperature. Um, and essentially the dark matter particles, the universe is expanding fast enough and the dark matter number density is, is low enough that they can't find each other fast enough to annihilate and they sort of then just freeze out and can no longer interact with each other. Um, so, right, so you get this period of freeze out here, and then it goes to a constant, <coughs> constant co-moving number density. So in this period, the actual number density is only reduced by the expansion of the universe. So these curves come from solving the Boltzmann equation, which is written down the bottom here. 
So now this n is the actual number density, not the preliminary thing, the actual number density. And we can see the sort of this competition I talked about on the earlier slide. So the rate of change of the number density is given by, well, let's say that n is very big. We can see here we've got an n squared, um, and here we just have one n. So when n is very big, this first term completely dominates. And the signs here work out to keep the number density equal to the equilibrium number density, which was this solid line. So while the number density is large, this first term dominates. When it gets much smaller, then the term on the right starts to dominate. And then this is just the reduction of the number density due to the Hubble expansion. Um, yeah, we can see that if you increase the, this is a thermally averaged cross-section. So what these arrows are trying to show is that as you increase the thermally averaged cross-section, then the particles can stay in equilibrium in the standard model for longer. And that results, that means they track the equilibrium number density for longer and result in a, a lower relative density. Um, right, so yeah, the thing to remember is that a higher, higher annihilation rate leads to a lower relative density. And um, we can see here that when this number is bigger, then the first term, first term is going to dominate for longer. And so the number density tracks the equilibrium number density for longer. Until at some point again, the Hubble expansion is going to take over. Okay, so from the Boltzmann equation, we can do some approximations and analytically solve it. And when you do that, you, you find that the, the relative density, which is currently this 0.12, is some order one factor times the current temperature of the universe cubed over the Planck mass cubed times the current Hubble constant squared times the thermally averaged cross section. And so these numbers a priori have nothing to do with each other, and they're very, very different in magnitude when they talk about different physics. But it turns out when you put these numbers in, you find that um, this is so you get the relative <coughs> density from a Picobarn scale cross section and for particles moving 10% the speed of light. And so this is the so-called Wimp miracle. The fact that this turns out to be, I mean, one Picobarn is a weakly interacting sort of cross section, and yeah. For, for masses around the GeV scale, GeV to TeV scale, and then you'd expect the particles to have 10% the speed of light at thermal freezer. So this is the velocity of thermal freezer. Um, so this is the so-called Wimp miracle, um, and this has motivated a lot of research in dark matter for 20 years or so. Um, but some people go a bit far and, and suggest, I mean, people sometimes understand that this argument suggests you should have weak scale particles at the electroweak scale. And that's going a little bit too far. I mean, you can see from this, this equation, all that's really constrained is the cross-section. So on dimensional grounds, the cross-section is going to go with some coupling to the fourth, perhaps, or some coupling to some power, over the dark matter mass squared. And so this relation is satisfied for a wide range of couplings. I mean, you can go all the way up to four pi, um, and the mass scales with the coupling. Or you can go down to very low couplings, um, and then very light dark matter, such as you get with, with axions and things like that. Um, so this, this, this can be satisfied for a wide range of parameters, so it doesn't necessarily point to the electroweak scale. But it, it's true it remains that for a weak scale coupling and an electroweak scale mass, this relation is more or less satisfied. However, there are some problems uh, still. So here we're, so so far we've been completely model independent, we're just saying there's dark matter that interacts somehow with standard model. Here I've, so this is a scan over um, a 19 dimensional supersymmetry space, this is a SUGRA in this paper. And the reason we're looking at this is that um, this is very good to parameterize a wide range of different dark matter models. So you can see there's a whole range of, uh, okay, sorry. So what they did, they did a parameter scan over this 19 dimensional um, space. And then for each point, they found the relative density that they'd get for the <coughs> supersymmetric partner. And then just plotted those as a histogram. So this number of models is sort of the number of points that have relative densities in this bin. And so they've color coded it as to whether the, the LSP that they get for that parameter point is Beano like, Wino like, Xeno like, or mostly, mostly mixed. And so what you can see from here, oh yeah, finally, um, when they did this parameter scan, they enforced constraints from LEC, LEC2 constraints. Uh, but the point to make is that just generically, if you have 
Beano like dark matter, then you typically get a, um, a relic density that's two to four orders of magnitude. Typically. This dotted green line is the actual measure of relic density. Whereas when you have a Wino or Higgsino and dark matter, then you, you can touch this line, but generally you have relic density that's an order of magnitude too small. And then if you want to go a bit further um, and impose some kind of naturalness on your Susie, so when they, when they go, the next thing they do is they constrain that the LSP has to be lighter than 500 GeV. And when you do that, you find it really follows out just exactly at the point that you want for the relic density. So, I mean, the lesson to take from these slides, I think I'm trying to express, is just that if you have um, a literally weak scale uh, particles interacting through the weak force, you don't automatically get the relic density. There's some problems in the model. So. Oh, sorry, what was the switch from one plot to the other? I had something coming in. Yeah, sorry, so this is where there's no constraint on the mass of the LSP. Oh. And the next one, they say the LSP has to be lighter than 500 GeV. Lighter than 500? Lighter than 500 GeV. Okay, so this is, so we've seen here that there are sort of some problems with electroweak scale. Or oh, sorry, we've seen that with electroweak scale, weakly interacting dark matter, you don't automatically get the relic density. Uh, but in the, in the 90s, there's this now famous paper by Wiest and Seckel, where they find, um, where they highlight three exceptions in the then current calculation of the relic abundance. So one they point to is so-called forbidden annihilation. So this is when the mass of the dark matter is just a little bit too light to go to two standard model particles. And so when they're just on shell at rest, that decay channel is, is forbidden. But so in the tail of the Maxwellian distribution of the dark matter particles, some of them have enough energy that they can in fact annihilate these standard model particles. And it turns out if you, that can give a huge enhancement of the cross section. And, and so that gives if you hadn't taken that into account, then your calculation of the relic density wouldn't be accurate. You can get a much lower relic density. But we're not going to talk about that today, but that's one that they point out in the paper. Another one they point out is uh, resonant annihilation. If you've got some resonance in your cross section, this can uh, greatly reduce the relic density that you get. Um, but I mean, th this wasn't taken into account in the calculations in the late 80s, but it definitely is now. And the third thing they point out, which is what we're going to talk about today, is co annihilation. So in the dark matter freeze out that we've seen so far, you have just uh, dark matter particles in equilibrium with standard model particles through some process. Now in the co annihilation scenario, there's this. This needs to be modelled by um, having another part, another particle X, which is also present. Typically, it'll have a mass quite close to the dark matter mass, and there can be processes like this which uh, keep dark matter and X together in equilibrium with the standard model particles. And so when you have this slightly richer system, then the Boltzmann equation changes a little bit to have an effective cross-section in here. Where this effective cross-section is the cross-section just of the dark matter annihilation, given by this top line. And then there's a factor with the, the cross-section of this process, uh, weighted by some things we'll talk about in a second. And uh, finally, the, the cross-section for this process here. Um, there's a range of processes that don't cha change the number of dark matter or the number of particles in the dark sector, and these don't enter into the effect of cross section. It's only the processes which change the, the number of particles in the dark sector. Okay, so we have um, the sum of these these terms, and so delta, which we're going to use use a bit later, you'll see again. This is the fractional mass difference between the dark matter and this x. This is the co-annihilating partner of the dark matter. And so that appears in this exponential up here, along with some uh, factor xf. So this is, the xf is the mass of the dark matter over the temperature at freeze out. And so we saw earlier on that, that curve of the, of the co-moving number density, that time is often parameterized as the dark matter mass over temperature. So, so that's what this is. Pardon? Uh, yes, my delta is negative, that's a typo. <laughs> that should be positive, sorry. Let's put absolute values around this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, that should be positive. And it's, it's very important that it is positive, 
because we see here we have an exponential <coughs> with a minus sign. And so, so when delta is very large, when this mass difference is very big, this term is exponentially suppressed. And you get back to the, the, um, the cross-section being just the dark matter annihilation cross-section. So that's the sort of a decoupling property that you'd expect from this scenario. Um, but so when you, when you numerically solve the Boltzmann equations, this factor xf comes out always between 20 and 30, typically between 20 and 30. And there's only sort of logarithmic dependence of, of this on the physics process, uh, which is why it's insensitive. And so that turns out that the, the values, that, I mean, this fractional mass difference where you have an important effect is less than 10, 10 or 15 percent. So you should think of two particles, dark matter and x, that have a mass 10 to 15 percent different. Or less. Yes. Okay, any questions so far on the mechanism of dark matter freeze out or permeation? Okay, so it's, um, it's quite a popular mechanism, it's used in the literature quite a lot. So what I, what I decided to do is look at this, the Greist and Sackle paper from the 90s, 91, and look at the, the recent papers that cite it for co-annihilation. And I decided to list the papers until they went both off the side and the bottom of a slide. So here we have it. And you can, if you look, I think the latest paper is from last June. So what I'm trying to express in this slide is that there's quite a lot of interest in co-annihilation and for a very wide range of models. So up here you have the sort of be no co-annihilation, neutrino co-annihilation. But then down here we've got models where the neutrino masses are generated additively or extra dimensional models. And so this sort of brings me to the next foundation of our work, which is the theoretical framework that we choose to use. So, so in, in dark matter physics, um, often effective field theories are used. And so for things like direct detection, uh, this is great because there the momentum transfer is very low. You can integrate out any heavy mediators, capture all the physics just in some, uh, just a handful of effective operators. But we're going to want to go to the LHC where the momentum transfer becomes large. And there you, you can have things like the mediator becoming on shell or directly producing the mediator. And then the effective field theories are no longer valid, so we have to go beyond them. At the other end of the spectrum, you can have UV complete models, like the SUGA model I was talking about earlier. And, I mean, here you can do complete calculations or are valid at the LHC, but there are many, many, many kinds of models, um, and the results can't easily be generalized between models. So luckily these are bridged by simplified models of dark matter. So this is a model where, to the standard model, you add only uh, two or three new particles, new degrees of freedom. And so there's a limited amount of simplified models. And you know, hopefully they capture a wide range of uh, the behavior of different UV theories. So over, I mean, over the last year and a bit before, there's been quite a lot of interest in simplified models of dark matter at the LHC. So this is um, the outcome of a workshop in Oxford in 2014, where they, I mean, a group of theorists tried to outline a set of simplified models of dark matter for LHC searches. And this was followed up by Atlas and CMS, who sort of created the Dark Matter Forum, where they wanted to, I mean, in this paper, they tried to provide uh, a minimal basis of dark matter models to influence the design of early one two searches, and at the same time, provide a thorough survey of realistic collider signatures of dark matter. So, so in these two works, they, they just look at dark matter annihilation to standard model, so they don't take account of co-annihilating uh, models. And we think these um, are an important avenue to look at. And so the project was sort of motivated a bit by this. And it's a, a step, you know, a logical step building on this work. Right, so our goal in this project was to provide a complete classification of simplified models of co-annihilating dark matter, which we called the co-annihilation codex. And so this, this is a bottom-up framework. Um, aimed at discovering dark matter at the LHC. And a lot of the LHC phenomenology we're going to talk about um, explicitly tests the dark matter freeze-out mechanism, this co-annihilation mechanism. And so with this classification, it will allow us to identify lesser studied models and LHC searches. And then in the event of a signal, which we hope is coming soon, uh, this can give a framework for the inverse problem. 
Okay, so on to the classification. So to do any kind of project like this, you need to make some assumptions. And we try to make a minimal set of assumptions um, that allows us to talk about a, bit, a wide range of models, but in a, in, a, in a way where we can make progress. So we assume that dark matter is a thermal relic. We assume that dark matter is colorless, electrically neutral particle in one N beta of the standard model SU3 plus SU2 plus U1 gauge group. And we're always going to choose beta, so this multiplet has um, an electrically neutral component. The current relation diagrams we're going to talk about are going to be 2 to 2, and they're going to proceed by a dimension 4 tree level couplings. And the new particles we introduce are going to have spin 0, half, or 1. So what you should have in the back of your mind is um, sort of dark matter x coming into some process, and something happens here, and standard model particles come out. I should point out we allow for the case for x to be equal to dark matter. So we're including all of the usual dark matter annihilation um, scenarios in this classification. But so this sort of effective vertex can be completed by an S-channel mediator, a T-channel mediator, or in a few cases with a four-point diagram, if everything is a boson. Uh, so this is the picture you should have in the back of your mind. Okay, so the way we actually go, go about doing the classification is we, we work in unbroken SU2 plus U1, and then we have we fix dark matter to be in 1N beta of SU3 plus SU2 plus U1, and then given the, we know the standard model uh, field content, so we can just iterate over all possible standard model pairs, and that allows us to find all, all of the X, all of the co partners, using gauge invariants, Lorentz invariants, and we enforce the Z2 parity on the dark sector, uh, to, which prevents dark matter. Okay. So once we've found all of the possible X particles, uh, we then find all S-channel and T-channel mediators using the same restrictions, but now further insisting on dimension four tree level couplings and that gauge bosons only couple through kinetic terms. Okay, so now we can have a, a, a look at it. This is an excerpt of one of the tables. And I guess it's, I think it's worth going through this in a bit of detail so you understand um, the different columns and entries and things here. So remember that for us, dark matter is always in one N beta. And so in the first column here, we have some model ID. So S is for S channel. T refers to X as one well open partner being an SU3 triplet. And then we have some number 11, 12, 13. Then we give the co annihilating partners representation on the SU3 position because we want. Um, and then there's only certain allowed values, I mean from hypercharge conservation, there's only certain allowed values of alpha plus beta, which we give in the next column. And then in the S channel, that the combination of what we've done so far fixes the um, the mediator's representation on the standard model gauge group. But in the next <laughs> column, we label the spin of the mediator, so whether the mediator is a boson or a fermion. And what this allows us to do is sort of talk about a class of models at once. Um, so, so for instance, if the mediator is a boson, then X, we know just from fermion number conservation, that X and DM have to either both be bosons or both be fermions. And then the same on the standard model side. So one line of the table here is really talking about this set of models with different spin assignments for X and dark matter. And anyway, it's labeled by, by whether the mediator is a boson or a Okay, the next column tells us the standard model particles that are on the right-hand side of the co annihilation diagram. So if we have this dark matter, this X, and this mediator, and the mediator is a boson, then the only standard model particles that can be on the right of the co-annihilation diagram are a left-handed quark, a right-handed anti-lepton, or a right-handed quark, uh, and an anti-lepton. Um, yeah, I should also say that we can, you're allowed to conjugate the boat as well. So there's this model here, and there's, you can conjugate all the particles, and that's another allowed co-annihilation diagram. In some cases, it maps onto the same model, sometimes it doesn't. The next column is, we title it SM3. So it can happen that if the mediator has the same quantum numbers as a standard model particle, then there's no reason you couldn't have a dark matter X standard model vertex. And so in that case, 
you could have a simplified model of colonization where there's no mediator at all. Um, yeah, we denote that here by the standard model particle that would play the role of the mediator, and we call these hybrid models, and we'll have a little bit more to say about them later. And then finally for the S channel, uh, for certain values of alpha, it's possible to have a mediator xx vertex, which we sort of denote in this final column. And we're not going to really have anything to say about that, uh, but when you look at one of these models, they, can, they may just have a slightly richer phenomenology because of the presence of this diagram. Sorry, the presence of this vertex. Yeah, I still haven't quite understood what the standard model 3 case is. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, so if you've got dark matter in 1 and beta and your co-annihilating partner in 3, n plus 1, and alpha, then there's no, there's no reason, reason under gauge invariance, Lorentz invariance, that you couldn't have a vertex with dark matter x coming in and a standard model quark coming out. And so if that's the case, then it's, there's no reason you can't write down a simplified model with only dark matter and x and no mediator. Yeah, uh, we, we call them hybrid models because you can either have an S-channel model if the quark radiates the gauge boson, so, and then it's like S-channel-like, or you can have the, the x, you can have dark matter and then x, the x radiates the gauge boson. Um, okay, I'm just this. So that would be an S-channel model that gives 2 to 2 co-annihilation, or you could also have Channel topology. Uh, so we call these models hybrid models. Okay. Or at least, yeah, the way you should read it is if you could have a correlation diagram with that matter X and the mediator, or you could also have one where you omit the mediator. But uh, we have another table about this. There's lots of tables. Okay. Any other questions on the this S channel X? Okay, the T channel is much the same. Um, but the main difference here now is that the, just when you look at the diagrams, the, you don't just have two classes of these sort of spin assignments. It falls into four classes. And that's where the both standard model particles are bosons. And then X dark matter and mediator have to all be bosons or all be fermions. Whether SM1 is a fermion, SM2 is a fermion, or they're both fermions. Um, and we've also dropped the MXX uh, column from the end. Because of the, because of the Z2 parity, you can no longer have an uh, MXX vertex. And then, uh, right, so this is a, a sort of table for the hybrid models. So here we have the dark matter in 1 and beta. We get the X representation, the alpha plus beta, and the standard model partner that comes in the, that interacts with the X and dark matter. And then we say which S or T channel, if you add a mediator, it can be extended to. But okay, the main point of this slide is that these are all of the hybrid models that we found. So there's only sort of seven, seven lines, seven different models. And now we're ready to look at the whole classification. So in the S channel, these are all of the sort of models that we found. We've got this SU type, uh, which is where the X is uncolored. ST where the coronary component X is an SU3 triplet, or where it's an octet or more exotic. It turns out there's only six birds here. And that's all of the S channel models that there are. I think there's 49 there put together. In the T channel, there's a few more, and this is mostly because you have twice as many sort of these uh, spin assignments. Um, but with a little bit of creativity, you can fit it all on one slide. And uh, there we have it, that's everything. You've now seen all possible simplified models of 2 to 2 co-annihilating dark matter. So that's great, so we, we have this classification of models now. Uh, now we want to do something with it, we can go on to LHC phenomenology. Do you have a table of which ones have already been studied? Um, we, we, in, in our notes we had a table, we didn't put it in the paper. Um, it turns out that most, um, most SUSY models can be sort of approximated by a T-channel model. 
So the T-channel model is, is very well studied, but the S-channel model is less so. Actually, we have, um, yeah, there's something that, we look at which LHC searches has been done, have been done and which constraints, of, which, which searches put constraints on these models and uh, go some way to answering the question. Okay, so LHC phenomenology. So we have this set of models where we have uh, dark matter X and uh, a mediator, and in some cases S channel or T channel. But just straight away, we, we know that they're, uh, without specifying which model we're looking at, we know that they're, uh, we can produce the X and the dark matter and the mediator. Let's say the X and the dark matter. Um, there are some common production mechanisms, that's what I'm trying to say. So if the, the coronality of X or the mediator um, are coloured, um, then they can be strongly produced through diagrams such as this one. Um, and when they have a weak charge, they can be produced through electroweak, draw and through vector bosom infusion. Those are any diagrams. And so the important thing to say about this is that we're pair producing the particles X, the mediator, or dark matter. And just from the quantum numbers of these particles, we know something about the rates of these processes. Because these are just gauge kinetic terms, we know the strength of these couplings. So these are sort of processes with rates that are guaranteed just by their, their gauge interactions. We can also um, just use crossing symmetry, reverse the co-annihilation diagram. And if both standard model particles are in the proton, then we could just use the, the coordination diagram to produce X and dark matter. So that's for producing the particles. Um, now we know the dark matter is not going to decay. And that's sort of one of our, one of our assumptions. Uh, but the X can decay through the coordination diagram. So here we've just crossed the dark matter over by crossing symmetry. And so the dark matter is going to escape the detector as met. And then remember that X and dark matter had a similar mass. They had to have a mass 10 or 15 percent. Um, yeah, the X is 10 or 15 percent heavier than the dark matter. And so that means typically there's not going to be much energy available to these standard model particles. So they'll come out. Um, we've labeled it soft here. Um, whether or not these particles are reconstructible in the detector or not depends on a range of factors. Um, it depends on the absolute mass scale of X and DM as well as their, their mass splitting. It also depends on what standard model particles these are. I mean, electrons are much easier to reconstruct than jets. Uh, it depends whether the system is boosted. Um, but the, the importance of this soft is that it's really uh, strongly dependent on the mass difference between the X and dark matter. So now that we have some production and decay modes, we can sort of stitch these together and uh, talk about LHC signatures. So in the first column here, so this is signatures that are common to all of the models that, that we've seen. So through a gauge interaction, you could pair produce dark matter. So that would just escape the detector with met. But then you can also add um, ISR onto one of the initial states. And so this is sort of the, the Feynman, Feynman diagram level signature. And then the next column, we say whether it's, that it can be produced either by a gauge interaction if the dark matter has um, SU2 charge, or if the standard model 1 is in the proton and it's the T channel, then it can be produced that way. In the detector, this is going to look like a mono Y, where Y could be a jet or it could be an electroweak gauge boson. Um, so that's the ISR, and the dark matter is, <coughs> is met. So, so from this stitching together of the production and decay, we've, the, first one, the first thing we find is the mono Y plus MEP signature, which is the classic signature for dark matter at a collider. And um, here, these are the searches. Um, these are references to LH CMS and Atlas searches, which in the paper it tells you which ones they are. But I've just put the numbers here to give you an idea of how many different searches are covering, covering these kind of signatures. Um, so we saw earlier that we could pair produce the X particles, and they can decay going to the soft standard model 1, standard model 2, and dark matter. So this notation means that we've produced two X's and some ISR. Um, so if the standard model particles are too soft to be reconstructed in the detector, this is just going to again look like mono Y plus met, with the mono Y being the ISR. Um, or it may be that the standard model particles can be reconstructed, and then you'll have up to four standard model particles. 
And so we can see straight away, um, just from this sort of quite broad overview, that, I mean, when we hunted through the Atlas and CMS searches, we only found one that's looking at this kind of signature, um, where it's looking for mono Y plus met plus one new one. Um, so straight away, this is pointing to an area of the LHC searches that could be improved. Um, yeah, you could be looking for other soft, soft standard model parts. Um, the next line is much the same, but let's push on. So that, that was production and decay and signatures of um, sort of modes that were common to all of the models that we've written now. And now some production and decay is common only to the, sorry, is, is applicable only to the S channel, which we'll talk about now. So in the S channel, you have the gauge bosons gauge on production, like we had before. Um, but then if the standard model particles are both in the proton, then rather than going to X dark matter, you can singly produce a mediator. So then this is going to be resonant production of a mediator at the glider, um, <coughs> which is great. I mean, this gives you additional search handles straight away. If only one of the standard model particles is in the proton, then through a diagram like this, you can pair produce the mediator with the other standard model particle. So that's production. Now when we go into decay, the X can decay to dark matter and soft standard model particles through the coronation diagram, um, as we saw in the common channel. We, we hadn't resolved this vertex now, but now we're saying we're in S channel, we can resolve this vertex and put in the S channel mediator. But now we can talk about how the mediator is going to decay. So we can either decay through the right-hand side of the coronation diagram, and it will go resonantly to two standard model particles, or it can first go to the through the other side of the coronation diagram, go to X dark matter, and then X can decay as above. And right, so this kind of mediated decay looks like a resonance. This kind of mediated decay looks much like um, the X you have um, met and um, soft standard model particles. So I'm not quite confused. What do you mean by one side would be annihilation, co annihilation yeah, diagram, sorry. and the other side? Um, so if this was the co annihilation diagram, yeah. Mm -hmm. and Let's have this being uh, Okay, let's draw it again. So this is the S-channel coronation diagram with diameter X and the external model particles. And through one side, I mean first decay from this vertex on this side. Or there's also this vertex and this decay over the mediator. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, so now like in the, the common for the, I mean, the common framework, we can now tie together the production modes and the decay modes. Um, we have a sort of another signature table. Um, so here we can, this is pair producing the mediators through a gauge interaction. And in this first line, this is the case where both mediators decay resonantly. And then the signature is two resonances. And so this is quite well searched for. There's quite a few different searches looking for different kinds of standard model particle resonances. Um, but then the next case that you look at, where one mediator decays resonantly, the other one goes to a soft standard model particles and met. You then have, I mean, it's quite well motivated through this coronation scenario to, to have this kind of process, which gives a signature of some standard model resonance plus met, and possibly some soft standard model particles. And we're a bit surprised to find that there was no LHC searches covering this kind of signature. So that was one of the nice outcomes of this sort of classification, and something that happens when you when you look at every possible every possible scenario that you can find sort of searches that have fallen under the radar a little bit. So that was a very nice result. Um, yeah, and then there's there's more signatures, but we don't need to go through them in detail. Uh, we do the same thing for T channel, but I'll just fly through this for time. Oh, okay. One point to make is that we saw in the S channel there were some gaps on the right hand side here. Um, here this is for the T channel models and here there's a wide range of searches that are covering all the possible signatures. And this is, I mean, as I alluded to before, that uh, models like SUSY are uh, best approximated by T channel simplified models 
and so a whole load of the CC searches um, cover this, this model space. Um, and then in hybrid models, there's um, yeah, production and decay. And so this is, as it is in the paper, this is the full signature table. We've got the common blocks that we talked about first, then the S channel, the T channel, and the hybrid. And so there's a huge amount of information uh, packed into this table. Um, yeah, all of the main signatures of all of the possible simplified models of current at 18 dark matter that we wrote down. And so we're hoping this is something that could be useful. Uh, I mean, both things, both the classification and this table of LHC signatures along with which current searches there are that, that can constrain the models. Uh, we hope this is something quite useful. So just as a point of reference, there's this hint in the you know, channel with a Z in it, uh, at Atlas and CMS, which category does that fall which, in? Which, um, well, it's sometimes called the edge uh, right, okay. signal. Which category does that fall into here? I'm not like hungry to mind right now which uh, kind of <laughs> signature that would be. Does okay, well. anyone happen to know what the, the Z edge is? It's well, it's where you have a, a decay that goes to a Z you know, of a higher CC particle. Mm -hmm. So you make a higher particle decays to a Z plus the dark matter. So it's a you know, Z plus missing energy. Is that something that's encompassed in this? Yes, it could, could, could be an off shell or on shell Z. So I think that would be something like, um, yeah, I think like maybe in here, sort of pair producing the mediator, it goes to MET plus standard model particles, where one of the, the Z is going to be one of these standard model particles. Mm -hmm. And maybe the other one is a jet, which isn't really weak to short, but it's not. Okay, great. So that's the, the, the body of the classification. And so I'd like to show you just a couple of examples of how to use the codex. The first one I'm just going to um, show you how to, we'll look at Bino-Gluino correlation, which is a sort of a well-known study, and see how to match up the notation that we used to there to the codex. And then we're going to go on to look at a, a case study that we, that we studied. Okay, so just matching up the notation of the table to what we used to, we're going to look at um, an example of a simplified model of Bino Guino coronation, um, where it goes through a mediator, which is a squad. So in the simplified model, we're going to have these extra fields, the Bino in 110 and fermion, the Bino in 810 and fermion, the squad. This is an appetite right handed squad. And so recall that the notation we used was the dark matter is in 1n beta. And so this is going to be 1, 1, 0 for us, so n is going to be equal to 1, b2, is going to be equal to 0. Um, with that, then the x, the correlating partner, which is the blue node, is going to be 8n alpha, where here it's n rather than n plus minus 1, n plus minus 2, the kind of entries on the table. And from alpha and beta, both being 0, we have the constraint that alpha plus beta is equal to 0. And the mediated representation is 3n, and then 0 plus all that. And so we can see straight away that um, a, a vertex between the Bino, Blumino, and Squark is not going to conserve SU3. It's not going to be gate invariant. So that means it, it can't be an S-channel model. So we go straight away to the T-channel tables. And with these spin assignments, we want the X to be a fermion, the mediator to be a scalar, and dark matter to be a fermion. So that means that the standard model particles both have to be fermions. And that puts us into this class uh, four of the spin assignments in the T-channel table. So here we go to a, a section of the T-channel table, and we find a box with x in 8 and alpha, which is what we were looking for. Up here, alpha plus beta is equal to 0. And then we're looking for an entry with the mediator in 3 and beta plus 4 thirds. And so in fact, it's this line, but we have the complex conjugate of this model. So I mentioned before that we, all of these simplified models, you can take the complex conjugate. And it has the spin assignment for as we want. And so just, I mean, a brief use of this is you can straight away see the, the standard model particles that are going on the right-hand side of the correlation diagram are uh, up clocks, these right-handed up clocks. So we can draw the correlation diagram 
straight away. And here I've just put in a couple of couplings, G1 and G2, for the two vertices. So we can then go to the signature table and say, OK, can we pair produce dark matter? How could we do that through a gauge interaction? Oh no, this, this is a complete singlet, so that's not going to happen. But if, the standard, if one of the standard model particles is in a proton and it's a T-channel model, then you can have this. And so we have one of the standard model particles in the proton. It's a T-channel model. So you can produce this through one of the, one of the vertices in the current animation diagram. And yeah, straight away you can say something about the strength of this interaction. The strength of this, this process is going to go as this coupling G1 to the fourth. Uh, times alpha, here I put alpha i, and it depends on what the y is. If this is a jet, then it'll be alpha star. And then you can just go sort of line by line through the table and say, is this, going, is this mode going to be produced? Um, you can say something about the strength of that mode. You see the signatures in the LHC, and you straight away have a list of existing searches which can constrain your model. Yeah, and right, so in the T-channel, it has all of these T-channel signatures with strengths that you know straight away, and you have a list of searches. Um, yeah, so that was just a brief, uh, showing you briefly how you can match up Bino Gluino correlation to the notation of the table, and how very quickly, just from the quantum numbers of the particle we started with, you've got a list of signatures and searches which constrain it. But we were more interested in going on and looking at sort of underexplored dark matter models. One way, another way you could think about this classification is if, say if you've got, you like be no dark matter, but you know that it overproduces in the early universe, sorry, if the relic density is too high, then you could view the, the, the codex as a list of possible co-annihilating partners you could add to your model that would reduce the relic density. Um, and sort of point to interesting models. So that's sort of how we thought about it. And our eye fell on, on this entry of the table, um, where this is an S-channel model, so we have an S-channel mediator. And on the right-hand side, the standard model particles are a quark and a lepton. So this means the mediator is a leptoquark. So this sort of, yeah, we found this interesting connection between leptoquarks and dark matter which we hadn't really come across before, so we were interested in exploring this a little bit. So, so here we've, it's quite general, we haven't specified n or beta, so to actually do some physics with this, we need to specify n and beta. So we kept that matter as um, a standard model singlet, and uh, uh, had it as a manual model fermion. And so then when you fixed n to be equal to one, and b to be equal to zero, then this, this shows you that the SV2 charge of x should be a 2. Um, if you go to higher SV2 representations, you have two choices here. But for n is equal to 1, you can only take one of these. And then for alpha plus beta equal to 7 thirds, um, alpha is equal to, sorry, beta is equal to 0, so alpha is equal to 7 thirds. And we know from these spin assignments that okay, both of these have to be fermions. And when we write down the Lagrangian, we chose this to be Manuel and this to be Dirac. And we have the mediator representation. So now we can draw the co-annihilation diagram, um, right, an S-channel co-annihilation diagram going to a lepton and a quark. And now we can write down the Lagrangian. Um, so here I'm just writing down the, the, the Yukawa type terms for these two interactions. So here we have the X, the mediator, the dark matter. <coughs> this is the left-hand interaction. And so here there's two possible standard model pairs, um, depending on the handedness. So here you get two terms. Um, it can happen for some simplified models, you have a whole long list of possible SM1, SM2. Um, but here we just uh, yeah, in this case there are two possible standard model particles. Um, so because this, is, well, this was just meant to be a case study, we chose some simple assumptions for, for these couplings to look at. Um, so we took we took this coupling just to be equal to zero, so we ignored this term. And then uh, for this coupling, I mean, there's a whole kind of flavor story that can be can be done here. You can have interesting flavor physics, but to make our life simple, then we chose every element of this to be zero except for the diagonal first generation coupling. 
So that means we just have a coupling between the mediator, and left-handed uptight quarks. Uh, sorry, yeah, left-handed first-generation quarks and electrons, right-handed electrons. And then because we were interested in the case where this mediator can decay either to the electric quarks or to the XTM, we set the first generation diagonal coupling here and this coupling to be equal. Um, and this is just to remind you, this delta we're going to start using again, and this was the fractional mass difference now with the sign that we're going out. <laughs> Okay, so um, so we put this simplified model through micrometers uh, to calculate the relic density. So here we've got the relic density on the y-axis and the dark matter mass on this axis uh, for a range of different parameters in the model. So just coming back to what we said earlier, um, just on dimensional grounds, the cross-section, the annihilation cross-section gauge is one over some mass scale squared, and because a higher relic density, sorry, a higher annihilation cross-section gives you a lower relic density. That's a way to understand the very broad behavior here where you have a low relic density for low mass and a high relic density for high mass. Let's see, are you adjusting those couplings that you had non-zero? I mean, you could always increase the annihilation as you increase the mass if you increase the couplings. Oh, I see, you've specified the couplings. Yeah, right, exactly, so each of these different Curves, the different colors and whether they're dashed or solid yeah, okay, correspond to different yeah. parameter okay. choices of the model. Right. Okay. Um, but it, it, so it turns out that the, the main process which is driving the relic density here is the co-annihilating partner annihilating to gluons. And so this is sort of, we saw that if we just had beno like dark matter, then that generically gives two to four as a magnitude too high in the cross section. And the fact, I mean, this process is a strong process, and there's also other processes keeping X and equilibrium with dark matter. And so you can sort of imagine that the dark matter rarely produces an X, but as soon as it does, the X decays to standard water particles because this rate is so strong. And so this is the sort of the magic of co-annihilation that you're using this diagram to bring down the, the abundance of the dark matter particles. Um, we can see some interesting features in here. So for the green line here, we've got the mediator having a mass of one and a half TeV. So when the dark matter mass is around half of that, then we get the resonant annihilation. And that's going through, through this channel, and dark matter going through the mediator resonantly to standard model particles. And that gives you these, these dips, um, and the, the orange curves are for a, for a lighter mediator. And the other feature, the one that's um, this, this dip here or this dip here, this comes when the dark matter is heavy enough to open up this annihilation channel of uh, pair producing the mediators. But the, the lesson to take away from this is that we started with Beno dark matter, which typically overproduces. And using co annihilation for sort of for two, four, five, sorry, let's say four to six hundred GeV dark matter, for a wide range of parameters, we can uh, reproduce the observed relic density. So that's good. We could uh, we can reproduce the exact, we, uh, we can get the correct relic density. Um, so now let's go on and use our signature table to find out how we could hunt for this at the dark matter. Sorry, at the LHC. So now we, we do the, the same process. We go through the lines in the signature table and we see if we can if we have the production mechanisms to give us these signatures. And so for us, we're no longer in a T-channel model, this is an S-channel model, so we can't produce it through, that, through this mechanism. And dark matter is a singlet, so there's no gauge production. So I've just put a um, horizontal line in here because you don't have this signature for this model. Um, yeah, I guess this is kind of interesting. This is, uh, this is the classic signature for dark matter, um, this mono Y plus met. And for this simplified model, if you only had the dark matter, then there'd be no, no hope hunting for it at the LHC. But because we now have sort of this, this X and mediator as well, then you can hunt for those particles instead. Um, but yeah, in the next line we can pair produce X with some ISR, and that gives us now the plastic signature. Um, but right, so the, the, the point is that we can sort of go through the lines of the signature table and find out the signature, signatures we expect. 
And here we do the same thing for the, the S channel portion of the table. And we have a set of, um, set of strengths, set of uh, uh, and again, just to reiterate, um, some of these processes only depend on the, um, the kinetic vertices, so we know the strengths of these, whereas other signatures depend on these Ys that we introduce. So then these signatures are really tests of the current annihilation model. Okay. Okay. So can we go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So when you have the, the, the X per production, mm -hmm. when we say SM1 soft, SM2 soft, which, which is the number that is again? So it's oh, okay. a yeah, so an electron, or? Yeah, so you take the standard model here that you've got. So we wrote this table to be just generic. So yeah, but in this models. particular case. So in this particular case, you've got a quark and electron, so this is a sort of So you have quark. like soft electrons. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. And I think there'll be a soft jet, but obviously you won't be able to see that. But the so soft electrons are important. Let's see. Let's see Okay, so now I've just put the, the two tables we had before the previous two slides together. Um, and yeah, so I've written, so this is sort of being general for, for all of the models. And now for the case where SM1, SM2 is a quark and a lepton, I've written down what we expect um, the signatures to be. Um, and the ones you'd want to look for first. So like monojet plus met, uh, the monojet plus met plus a soft electron, which is exactly what you pointed out. Um, so we have a we have a list here, and so the ones that are in black are ones where existing uh, searches can constrain the parameter space of this model, whereas the ones in red are where there's I currently no um, LHC searches. So this one where there's partial coverage again, this is looking for a soft new one, and in our case we've got a soft electron, so we don't have a constraint from that search. And so now we're going to go on. Um, and look at how the existing searches constrain the parameter space of this model, and then look at the impact of these new searches that we've found. Uh, we're going to look at the ones with arrows next to them here. Um, the reason being, I mean, the, the final state in here is similar to the final state here, but here you have a resonance, so we expect this search to be much more constraining than these, and are similar here. So we, we, we didn't really look at these, we expect them to not be nearly so powerful. Okay, so here we have, um, so we've set in this in this block, we've set the mass difference to be 10%, and uh, this complicated thing here is essentially just the Y coupling. So the two couplings in the co-annihilation diagram that we set equal, and we set them to 0.5. So here the parameter space is the dark matter mass and the mediator mass. It's got the sub L cube for the tunnel electric part. Okay, so, um, so there were searches for electroquarks, and this is where you will pair produce a particle that will go to a quark and a lepton. And so using, using that search, we put constraints on our model, which is this blue curve here. So, so, the reason, so it's, it's independent of the dark matter mass, because the dark matter doesn't really enter into this diagram. The only time the dark matter does enter into this diagram is when the mediator is heavy enough, or the dark matter is light enough, so that the mediator can either go to quark lepton or it can also cater X and dark matter. And when it can decay to X and dark matter, then it doesn't always choose this decay, it sometimes chooses the other decay, and that gives you the weakening of the constraint down. Um, this, this green region, uh, this is from the constraint coming from one resonant leptoquark and um, another electron coming up. Uh, and so, yeah, so the, the, the production rate of this, this two-body final state, or three-body final state, um, this depends now on one of the vertices in the co-annihilation diagram. This is the mediator going to the standard model particles. Whereas here, the production rate of the two mediators only depended on the gauge kinetic terms. So for, for changing the value of y, which was this 0.5, this blue constraint is going to stay where it is, but then this green constraint goes back and forward. Um, and so say if, if there had been a, um, a signal seen in here somewhere, then this could tell you that both pair producing M and the measurement in this channel will tell you something about the, the, the coupling constant in the co-annihilation diagram. So it's nice, there's nice complementarity between these searches and they're, they're testing different aspects of the co-annihilation diagram or of the simplified model. 
this, uh, this search down here, this is this comes from, so it's just a, a monojet search, and so for us, this is going to constrain paired production of the X, where the X then goes to dark matter and the electron spark, but assuming these are too soft and are not reconstructed, and so it just looks like um, just looks like a, a jet and net in the detector, and this orange region is the constraint you get from that. Again, here you can see it's only the coronary compartment X, uh, not the mediator that comes into the diagram, and so this constraint is independent of the mediator mass. So again, there's some complementarity between these searches. So that's the uh, constraints the existing searches put on our model. So now we can look at these two new searches that we highlighted. One is where we pair produce X, uh, but there's a soft lepton, and we, we, um, we cut on this soft lepton to get rid of some of the standard model background. And uh, we can see that when we do that, this, this orange uh, region jumps right up to this, this red line. And here this is what you get for, for two different choices of the PT cut on the electron either greater than 25 GeV or greater than 10 GeV. So you've got a, a huge improvement in the, in, in the um, coverage of the parameter space for this search. The other search that we looked at was when you pair produce the mediator. One of them decays resonantly to a lepton on the plot, and then the other one decays to a net plus soft standard model particles. And so this was the one that, this was the signature where there were currently no LHC searches looking kind of topology. And so this, this gives us this green region here. And so it turns out with this set of searches, this region isn't particularly competitive, but it does depend on, on the parameters in the model and the choice of model. And for different for different choices of parameters, uh, this, this can stick out here a little bit. Um, it wasn't quite as good as we hoped it was going to be, but it's, it's still another um, important search. Okay, and so that brings me to the end. Um, so the co-annihilation codex, um, it gives a complete list of simplified models of co-annihilating dark matter. As I've tried to highlight, the, you have guaranteed production strengths of some of the particles through their kinetic terms, whereas other signatures, sorry, other production mechanisms depend on the coupling constants and the co-annihilation vertices. And these give um, sort of complementary tests of the mechanism and the kinetic terms lead to guaranteed signatures of the LHC strengths that you know something about. Um, this, this work allowed us to classify the signatures of the whole set of models in a fairly compact way, which allowed us to identify new signatures and to look at interesting models, such as this one with the connection between leptoquarks and dark matter. And yes, the, I think the lesson is that there's a huge number of models out there with co-annihilating dark matter. Um, each with their own interesting collider signatures to study, both at the MHC and at future colliders. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other questions that haven't been asked before? Okay, if not, let's thank Mike again.